Rebuild of the favorites. We here for the latest. South side or the north side. Not tuned to the greatest. Home team for the home teams. Both sides got our own rings. On the mound or the long ball. But we don't pull the wrong strings. Yeah. It's that time of the year now. Wrigley or Gantt, so the whole league that we hear now. New show with a new mood. Discussions and interviews. Straight rumors that might be. This is Pinwheels and Knife. What is up, everybody? Welcome to a special Wednesday afternoon edition of Pinwheels and Ivy. I'm Mitchell Kaminsky. Alongside me, although, although, uh, you know, honestly, rough start to the season for the Sox so far. Uh, how are you feeling about your Cubs? We'll start with the Cubs since they've won a couple of more games, but we got a lot to talk about. Obviously, White Sox injuries, White Sox offense sucking, Pedro Gasol being a boob. But there's plenty to talk about on the north side of town as well. Uh, we'll start with you. How are you feeling about how are you feeling about the Cubs? The Cubs, the Cubs have been good. They've been really good. The offense has been amazing. Uh, I mean, take away the shitty loss on Monday to the Padres when they were winning eight to zero, lose nine to eight. First time the, that's the largest steps that the Padres overcame. Cubs haven't blown an eight nothing lead in twenty two years. So you know that wasn't great. But then you see. They like they weren't down themselves. This wasn't like a oh well, this is gonna derail us for this week. You know, guys are down. Very next game, they're facing another good pitcher in Joe Musgrove. They get him out in the fifth inning. Cubs score five, Cruz to a win. Uh, the offense is just as I think Kevin's pointed out on Twitter, other people have pointed it out as well. They're this patient approach that they have. They finally have guys in the right position, I think, in the batting order. I know Sox fans, Cubs fans, every single fan base, every, no matter if your team is good or bad, we're always going to complain about our lineups. But what fixes that, right? When you have good players like that, yep. and you can just, it's like, okay, this guy's batting here, of course. Like, it's, you're, you're going to get the same lineup every day. And that's what we're getting from the Cubs. Ian Happ uh, is, is, has like a near, like 450 on base percentage at the leadoff spot. Say Suzuki is the perfect two hitter. He's hitting everything. Uh, every ball he hits is like a hard hit ball, it seems right now. Cody Bellinger isn't even, he, he's kind of struggling right now. It doesn't even matter. Christopher Morel is cleaning it up, up and down the lineup. I mean, I, I remember talking talking about it uh, pregame with you, uh, sending you a message like, oh, Hap, Suzuki, uh, Morel, but it's, it's everybody. Jan Gomes hasn't really done much, but then he hits a home run uh, to get the Cubs going against Musgrove on Tuesday night. Miguel Amaya, the other bat, C Cubs catcher, he's been getting his hits when he's starting. Uh, a guy that uh, we've talked a lot about for, for a few years, Nick Madrigal. He's coming in off the bench. When he's starting, he's getting a couple of hits here. He's, getting, he's driving in some runs and clutch spots. I mean, there, there's little to complain about right now. M Michael Bush, another guy, sorry, Bush Beer, shout out uh, to you and uh, Kevin doing those. I do owe one, so hopefully he hits a couple more this week and uh, we'll get those next Wednesday night. But it, it's great. The approach is it's reminding everyone of the 2016 team that we all know how that season ended for the Cubs. And throughout that entire year, they had a stable leadoff guy in Dexter Fowler. Like, finally, a, a good leadoff guy. And he was there the year before in 2015 as well. But that was, like, his career year. Like, is Say Suzuki going to put up MVP numbers like Chris Bryant? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> He's so good uh, early on. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's funny. It sounds like bizarro world from what's going on in the south side. And I must say, after blowing an 8 nothing lead, it kind of reminded me, like, when the Sox in 2022 blew that 8-2 lead in the ninth inning. That like it, it was like an air like air was let out of the balloon. They were terrible for like the next week. I mean, they were bad for most of the season, but you can really tell it was deflating for them. I thought the Cubs did a really nice job last night responding after a loss like that. And shout out to Albert Alzale. I thought that was a smart move by Craig Council. It's non-save situation, but like you know what, you blew the save the night before. I'm gonna let you go face the same guys in the heart of the order that you know. Stuck it to you last night, and he came out and responded really well. So I thought that was that was a good moment for for them and him. It was a confidence builder to show, hey, I still trust you as my closer, even though you just blew the second save of the season. And I gotta say that move, I was a little iffy. I was like, oh man, what if? Because like even it, it was, a, I mean, it was a four run lead. It was gonna be 
pretty rough if he blew that one. Like, I wasn't worried about that, but I was just concerned of like, oh man, what if he does give up a hit, a couple hits, a guy who scores, how is that confidence going to look? But like you said, it paid off. He faced the same guys in the heart of the order, got Tatis, it was it set him down in order. I mean, that's good. And it's, and I've been, I've been talking about uh, with some friends about Azalei. And I'm like, last year was his first like full year in the majors, like finally was healthy uh, until, well, until the very end in September. But it was like his first full year of success, you know, he became the Cubs closer. And we, I, I think a lot of this conversation happens in the NFL with quarterbacks, like guys come out of nowhere or not out of nowhere, but like, you know, they finally have their, their, their breakout and then they get, they get too hot. Joe Burrow, he got too hot in the offseason after – They get some tape on you a little bit. They kind of see what you're doing. And then, like, I was like, like always always been a swaggy dude. I like it. Obviously, no problem with that. But, you know, he's feeling himself. And, you know, Cubs always do the the pregame photos, guys coming in. Uh, I remember they were doing those uh, for opening day when they went to Texas. And, you know, he's he's got the fancy glasses on, the nice, the nice fit. And it's cool, but it's like – is, is he a little too confident? Does he think too highly? Like, uh, opening night, he gave up that home run to Janikowski. The guy has, like, 10 home runs in his career. And I was like, ah. And then he has this second blown save, and you're like, ah. You don't want that confidence, like, shaken. It's early. It happens. He he He's a guy who throws a lot of strikes, so he's he's going to get hit. It's not like he's uh, – He's, we we're talking about, he's not Josh Hader. Like, he's not going to be striking out no, an average. He's of like, kind of been used like that, though. They use him for like the eight. They'll put him in in like the eighth inning and try and like, all right, like, hey, try and get these. Yeah, guys. I was, and like, that's the thing that we can get to the, the bad part of the Cubs. Like, Cubs offense, nothing to complain about. Up and down lineup, they're hitting on all cylinders. Their approach is fantastic. Uh, I know it's early in the season. One other stat I wanted to bring up was it's, it's, it's only been 11 games, it's April. You know, managers aren't going to be pushing the starting pitchers past like 100 pitches. I, I get that, but there's only been one starting pitcher that's gone to the sixth inning against the Cubs. That was Nathan Navaldi on opening day. Everybody else, they, they can't get past the fifth. I mean, Yamamoto was fantastic on Saturday. He shut him down, uh, but even then, he struggled the first couple innings. Cubs got the bases loaded, and the first inning that was rough when they struck out three straight times. Uh, that was probably their worst sequence uh, of the year. Uh, but even then, they put pressure on him where he couldn't go deep into the game. He was out of there, and the and the Cubs aren't facing like bums. I know that Colorado series; it's like it's the Rockies, right? But I mean, L.A. Bobby Miller, that dude looked unhittable in his the previous start. Cubs got him out of there in the second inning. Uh, Gavin Stone on Sunday, he was out of there. Uh, this series against the Padres, you Darvish. We know he's a good quality pitcher. He was frustrated. He was out of there like after the third or fourth inning. Joe Musgrove couldn't get out of the fifth. Uh, very uh, interesting to see that matchup on uh, the series finale today against Dylan Cease, which I can't remember. I, I think the Cubs hit him last year maybe. Uh, I can't really remember. With him, though, like you talk about knocking pitchers out early, he is prone to – throwing a lot of pitches so he is right if you can get him to you know you stay patient get a couple walks off of seas he's another guy that you can knock out easily by the fifth inning even if he does has have his good stuff because he tends to throw a lot of pitches now the bad stuff for the cubs though the, the bullpen right now and one of the reasons that alizelai had to come in in the eighth inning on monday is right now number one they're gassed the starting pitchers aren't going deep they kind of got screwed on sunday or not, not screwed. I mean, they won the game, but Shota Managa was lights out against the Dodgers. But then they had the long rain delay. He obviously was taken out after four innings. Cubs had to use uh, Yancy Almonte for one, uh, and then they did get uh, they did get saved a little bit by uh, Daniel Palencia, who came up. He pitched three innings, but then on Monday, the first game, you know, Assad, fifth starter again. He goes five innings. He has to come out for the sixth. He's getting to like 90 pitches. He's running out of juice. You know, he gives up a hit, the home run to Cronenworth. Craig Council is already, <laughs> is already, at, he has to go to his like six, seven, eight relievers in the bullpen. Jose Quas has been terrible. Um, looking back, that looks like an awful trade. Uh, Cubs traded Nelson Velasquez to the Royals last year. He was fantastic for them last year. I think he's off to another good start. Or like, no, he he's going to hit home runs for them. Um, and Jose Quas is like 
DFA candidate number one right now for the Cubs. So that's not good. Uh, the most concerning part to me, though, is the veteran, uh, Hector Neris. He, I know, Mitch, we've talked about, and last year we got burned, especially me and Kevin, and, you know, socks a little with Colas, but we really had spring training numbers. What can you really get from them? You know, last year it's like, oh, Hayden Wisniewski looks fantastic. He's going to be great. He wasn't really that great. He kind of settled into a reliever role uh, in the second half, and he was fine. But this whole starting pitching thing out of spring training, that didn't that didn't correlate, right? Hector Neris, veteran guy, sucked in spring training. He looked awful. Right. <laughs> like every every outing he was walking guys, giving up home runs. It was bad. But tr- he's like 35. He has a 10-year track record of being just one of the best uh, – or not really, but like a, a – a stable reliever who will get you 70 to 80 appearances every year. You know he's what you're going to get. He's going to take the ball. Career. He's going to be good. He's been terrible. He He's not throwing strikes. And when he does, they're getting hit hard right now. Uh, it's just bad. They just have to hold on right now. Because I do think, unlike other years, if it was other years, I would have been like, oh, man, this is just going to be like 2019. The offense is going to be great, but the bullpen is going to kill him. I am a little more confident this year because as long as uh, Jameson Tyone comes back, and he, I think he might be back in a week or maybe 10 days, uh, and then Justin Steele went down opening day, hamstring. I think he's going to be back in May. So you, gotta, you just kind of have to survive these next three weeks. And once you get to that point, you can use Assad, who's right now your fifth starter. You can move him to the bullpen. Ben Brown, Ben Brown, who pitched uh, four shutout innings on Tuesday, he can be a Josh Hader type, a multi-inning, or like an Andrew Miller guy, right? right? You bring him in, tough part of the game, it's the sixth inning, whatever, guys on base, it's a two-run game, heart of the order, your starter's running out of gas, you bring in a guy like him, he cleans up that inning, maybe he pitches two more, you shorten the game, really, like, right away. I think that could be a case there, but... If he's also giving you quality innings, but I, I I know it's only two starts, but Kyle Hendricks is <laughs> Kyle Hendricks is just getting those, beat up the left. Right. But it's only two starts. I'm not I'm not yeah, all for it. Yeah. I know some fans were like, dude, come on. He's facing two great teams. It's only two starts. What are you doing? That's not what I was saying. I'm just a little there's gonna be questions, there's gonna be conversations sure. when guys get healthy again. Yeah, like, he's, he's, he's not a he's not a like, he doesn't have to move like, Hendricks yeah. to the bullpen. No, no. So the, the one worrying part right now is, the, is definitely the bullpen. I was delayed two blown saves, but again, that I mean, that was tough coming in with runner on. Uh, I know we were talking about with Kevin on, on Tuesday night in our chat, and it's like, yeah, I, he even even last year he had a couple times when he came in to get more than three outs. Uh, and I think he maybe he was like 50-50 in those games. So yeah, I don't. I think moving forward. I, that's the other thing. It sucks, right? Like the Cubs, I've been saying it for years, as frustrating as it is, early on in the season, it always seems like some, even when they were good in 2016, I feel like the bullpen kind of struggles early because like you don't really have set roles yet for everyone. But then it figures itself out and it's like, it's like, all right, they got figured out, right? But it's like, how many, how many games can that cost you early on? Like right. how good are the Cubs going to be in 2024 where this eight run lead that was blown doesn't matter at the end of the season. Hopefully they're going to be good by a lot, but, but the NL central right now, I mean, I know like two weeks in it's, it's looking kind of good. The pirates on fire, the, yeah, the, yeah. the brewers, I thought the brewers were going to lose all their like stupid luck uh, with council gone, but they're still winning games. I mean, the reds, those reds are, they can hit the ball. They're, they're about to pick up probably two, three wins this weekend uh, when they come to Chicago. <laughs> too, so uh, that's, but yeah, I will say bullpen, for, just survive. Just survive yeah. these next three weeks, and I think it's going to be just fine. I will say for Az- Alzale, uh, I did find it funny because, and, and look, it's hypocritical for me to be like anti celebrating because I'm a big Tim Anderson fan and Bat Whip fan. And I'm all for Tatis getting fired up after hitting a home run. But like, you know, I think he was kind of making an ass of himself around the base pass. Like, you know, you, you made your point running to first and then he, you know, showboating all the way around the bases. I like the fact that he came in first two pitches high and tight. Like, hey, buddy like i'm still establishing the inside corner of the plate send a message comes right back strikes him out like that was like all right like that's how it's done right there you don't hit him he sent his message 
And then he still got the out afterwards. So I thought that was a nice, nice little revenge for him. Going back to the lineup real quick, I did want to ask you, because Christopher Morrell is one of those guys that's off to a really hot start. I saw you had a tweet out with his numbers the other day. What do you do with them here? Do you, do you keep him in the DH spot? Do you keep giving him spots at third base? Because I feel like he's a guy you have to keep his bat in the lineup somehow. But they're, they're pretty deep on the offensive side, so it would be almost better if you could use that DH spot for someone else. But the way the defense has gone early on, maybe you don't want to be throwing away runs, especially with how the bullpens look. Where are you at at this point in the season with what to do with Christopher Morrell? I mean, at this point, like you said, the, the perfect thing for him is you need to have that DH spot open. The, the way Council has been using it, he's been – He's been giving uh, the outfielders a day off, which is keep those legs fresh, which is good. That's right. Um, and that and that's one key part of having Morel just be not horrible at third base, right? And I think it, hopefully moving forward, I know the Cubs' offense isn't going to be this amazing like every single game out, but I mean, I, th- I think the offense wasn't really the problem in 2023 either. I think they're going to continue this, and Chris- Christopher Morel is a big reason. And I know that we talked about like how how do you hide guys at the major league level? I mean, it happens. And what and what Craig Council is doing right now? Cubs get a lead. You know, it's the sixth, seventh inning. You take them out. You you put Nick Madrigal in there, and I think that's what they're going to keep doing. Um, you know, Madrigal is going to get his starts uh, at third against some lefties, and that's fine. Again, as long as the rest of the offense is rolling. Nick Madrigal doesn't have to hit. I'm not, you won't hear, I promise. I won't, if the rest of the offense is complaining, Nick Madrigal goes 0 for 4 with like three ground outs. I'm not going to be like, ah, fuck Nick Madrigal. Get him off my team. I know I did that opening day. I was being reactive. Uh, sorry. Hand up. I apologize. But I, they have to, because that's the key. That's what makes, that's what makes these, this lineup so deep is that you do have Merle at third base. You do have that DH spot open. You can either use that to give one of your outfielders a day off, and then you have Mike, Mike Talkman in there. Dude is he's starting half the games, and he's like top five in walks. Like he's just an on base machine. He keeps doing it. Uh, uh, Garrett Cooper, another guy off the bench. He, I mean, he, every game he's played, I think he has a hit. Um, you, you just keep doing it. You have to. You at least have to give him this month. You at least have to give him uh, April to see. Okay, are you improving? Are you getting any better? Because you can't go, you can't be wishy washy about it. Because you don't want to go to like June. Madrigal gets more starts. Maybe he gets injured because that is the thing with him. He does get injured, or he struggles at the plate, and you're back to wait. Okay, Morel, we need you back, and then you're like, wait. Well, he just went like a month and a half, right? Not really playing at third base. Like you can't have that. So you kind of need an answer after April. Right. And I think that's that's what they're going to keep doing it. They're going to keep, you know, they're going to keep subbing him out after big leads. And hopefully that's that's good enough. One way to do that it's, uh, for him to make it easy. It's like, hey, get more strikeouts as the pitching staff, get more yeah. pop ups, which, which we've been saying that showed him and I has been fantastic. Um Turn everyone into fly ball pitchers. Yeah, just turn everyone into fly yeah, ball. Maybe, maybe change that uh, once we get to the summer. But uh I mean, hey. It, I don't think anyone thought it was going to be that. It was like three errors in his first like four games. Like that, that was rough. That was rough. But this past week, I don't think he's made maybe one. So, hey, improvement. Hey, we made an improvement from week one to week two. <laughs> I think a lot of it is confidence too. Because I feel like Chris, he's not an idiot. Like he heard all the no- some of the noise I would imagine during spring training. He was being asked about it, about the defensive struggles. He knows that like he has to be good at third base. And I think he's putting a lot of pressure on himself. When you make one error early in the year, it is very easy for that to snowball. That's why everyone says like baseball's mental game. And it's so true because when you have 162 games, it can be hard. It, it's easy to get frustrated. And I think you make an error early in the season, it can start to snowball. So I mean slow progress, I guess. But I wonder where the confidence is at at third base, knowing that his glove was in question and he's already made what is it, four errors on the season now? Yeah. And not to make excuses, but that the one in Colorado, I mean, or against Colorado, like it was. I know I get it. It's baseball. These guys get paid, but it was like, it was like 20 degrees. Ball was wet. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was, maybe he makes that error anyway. Right. But, uh, well, actually that besides the bullpen, the Cubs defense, I know we've been seeing some great highlights from Nico Horner. Dancy Swanson does. Michael Bush had to play in that Dodgers game at second base. It's like, I think he 
frames to his left, made a nice diving catch. I was like, ooh, that was nice. That was good. But then, like, there's also been it, – it's gone beyond the past the first week. We're like – it's been a little shaky at times, like the the blow up on um, on Monday when Quaz came in. I, Swanson had an error. Talkman played a single into a triple. Like the team defense had, besides Morel, like Morel, that, that's his own thing. Like, but we kind of expected that he was going to be good, right? But everybody else, like these errors are what the hell's going on? I don't know, I don't know what's going on, but hopefully they got those out of the way. Um, but yeah, no. Vibes are good. I, I, there's not a lot to complain about. I'm not the bullpen. It's rough. The the guys at the end. That's rough. But like, hey, bright spots. Drew Smiley, veteran guy. I wanted him traded for something else in the off season, but you know he did do a good job as a reliever at the end of 2023. He's a, he's a reliever right now. He's like the 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 long guy in the bullpen. I mean, he's getting the job done. Yancy Almonte couple good outings i want him to be good he looks cool he has you know he has the he's part of the chain gang um good mustache too good mustache but uh i mean i was that uh that was i think that was a good confidence builder i was a little iffy on it but going back out there after blowing the save heart of the order you know, facing Tatis again, striking him out. Maybe that was good. That good, good confidence. As it wasn't a safe situation. Say he does blow it. You know he's not. I mean, like, you know he's probably not your guy. That's the thing, though. If he if he would have blown it or, like, would it look shaky again, the Cubs have no guy. <laughs> no, and then, yeah. Like, the next guy is Hector Neris, and he's, he's looked worse. Right. So that is the concern going forward. But, again, I think it's only survive for these next three weeks. You get your starting pitching, you get your rotation healthy again. Yeah, you got and then you can important. maneuver some guys into the bullpen. And I think it's going to be fun. I think at this point, though, it's pretty obvious. I would imagine they're probably trying to add an arm, assuming they're still in contention at the deadline. I'm going to bring up a name later, and uh, I think you're going to like it, Mitch. All right, let's see. Well, who you got before we get to the Sox talk? Because that's going to be well know, going on a rabbit hole there with all the issues they got. Who, well, who, who, who we can. Good? This is going to be. We can lead right into Sox talk, and we'll, we'll lead. In, we'll lead into one of the positives. He has, I think, this year left of control, and next year, so a year and a half, or let's call it two years. Uh, and he's he got transitioned back to the bullpen this year. He's looked amazing. What do the White Sox want for Michael Kopech? I don't know. You know, that's a good question. Honestly, I could see them trading Kopech too with his value high because as good as Kopech's looked, I think I honestly think they got their next closer lined up with Jordan Leisure. He mm -hmm. has really impressed me. They put him in in a situation in Saturday's game. They were down two nothing at the time. Runners on base, so it was a pretty big moment with the way the offense is playing. You really can't afford to let this game get blown wide open. And there was, I think, there was two outs. They only needed to get one out. First batter comes in, he gets a weak pop-up. And it was one of those that just kind of fell in between where, like, he did what he was supposed to do, got the weak contact, runner scores, makes it 3 nothing. So now you got the bases loaded and Bobby Witt Jr. coming on. Best hitter on the Royals. And it would be easy for him to get frustrated in a situation like that. And at this point of the game, too, everyone in the stadium standing up, chanting for Bobby Witt. So, like, it's a tough situation to be in for a rookie. You're facing the best hitter, bases loaded, just got a tough – like. Pitch that arguably should have been an out. He comes back and he strikes the guy out, and that was like really impressive. I was like, okay, like that—that that was a good confidence building moment. And it's moments like that why I'm continuing to watch this team despite that they're so bad because they do have a lot of young pieces that are we're, we're seeing what they can do for the future. And he's one of them I've kept an eye on, and I've been impressed with him early. He looked good the other night too um, against Cleveland, so I could see them moving Kopech just because his value is high now, and you have a guy lined up that could. Um, replace him, but uh, Kopech's been Kopech's been good. I think that's it, I knew we 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 were talking about that when they made that move. That was the best move for him because now he can throw gas without even thinking about it. He has that electric fastball, and last night in Cleveland, his slider was working too. So when you're throwing 101, 102, and then you got that slider going, I mean, it's going to be very tough uh, to hit for him. So uh, who are you giving up for Kopech? Is we 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 have a trade. Uh, so the White Sox obviously mm. lead offense, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I, 
that's the thing. Who, who do you get? What do you get? What is it? it is it second base? I feel like this has been the same question yeah. since we started the podcast in 2018. White Sox need a second baseman or a right fielder. Um, yeah, probably so. both. Although we we have Dom Fletcher starting to come along. I know he technically is our center fielder right now, but that's just be only because Luis Roberts injured. I do think he could he could be that guy. Uh, he's starting to look pretty good. But the defense has been brutal. And that's what's been so frustrating is because the goal of this season for Chris Getz was saying, we are struggling to get free agents. We're going to improve the defense and make it more attractive for free agent pitchers. Well, if you're a free agent pitcher looking at the White Sox, you get no run support from this offense. And the defense, quite frankly, has looked like ass. Like up the middle has not been good. Martin Maldonado, we were told, was supposed to be this good defender. It's good at handling pitching staffs. And I think he's done a good job working with the pitching staff. We've seen sign with that. But defensively behind the plate, it's been rough. He's looked like a stooge back there a couple of times. He doesn't throw anyone out either. 0 for 5 trying to throw out base dealers. He struggles to catch the ball oftentimes. Um, so that's been rough to watch, which you need his defense to be good. If you're going to put him in the lineup, the defense needs to be good because you're not getting anything from him. Then at shortstop, Shoemake has had some struggles there there's been a couple really bad airs uh i mean and yeah it's just embarrassing they look like a triple a team on defense you know we got pit leon like oh air mail the first baseman the royal i think they blew a lead sunday because of that um latter monday's game against cleveland they look bad so there's a lot that this team could need so honestly like any sort of talent because there's so many holes to fill at this point <laughs> <laughs> They'll take maybe uh, an Alexander Canario could play your center f- or outfield help DH. He's like 23 years old. Uh, also some speed. Uh, there's a uh, Luis Vasquez. Uh, he's at triple a uh, he's been hitting. He's been a home run hitter the last couple of years in the minors for the Cubs. Great. You want to talk about Chris Getz want defense. Luis Vasquez right now is an MLB ready shortstop. So there you go. If you want probably to ask him, Montgomery is probably going to be up later this season. <laughs> that's good. That's where that gets a little tough. But like, I would not be opposed to a power hitting infielder that uh, plays good defense. Some power. Uh, I mean, the, uh, I, I think we, I think we could have something that, that might be something to keep an eye on. If Kopech keeps building Cubs. Building. I mean, yeah. So White Sox fans, I'm, uh, you know what? I'm not going to bring up Nick Madrigal again. Those, those, those trade proposals for me, for the White Sox off the table, I'm moving on. Now I want Michael Kopech. Now we just have to figure out what the White Sox want back. Uh, so, Mitch, you talked about the offense. I mean, the defense has been bad, but the offense, yeah, <laughs> the offense That's been the worst. Well, you I mean, talk- they scored. Hey, they scored seven on, uh, on Tuesday. It, it, this is true, and that was the lineup that everyone was clowning. Was like, this is the worst lineup <laughs> we've put out. It's funny too, listening to you talk about the Cubs' offense. It's like the complete opposite of what we are. Because, like you said, it's like they got good hitters up and down the lineup. So that makes it easy when you're making a lineup. So before I get into like some of the stuff I've noticed with the offense, like the bottom line is this team is devoid of a lot of good major league hitters, especially when you have Robert, Eloy, and Mancata taken away from that lineup. It's pretty rough. So like it, there's a lot you can say that these guys should be doing, but if you don't have the talent, like they don't have a lot of good major league hitters. But the things that have stood out to me with the offense is number one, when they've been shut out this year, they are constantly behind in the count they get behind the count early saturday's game they had 30 at bats they were ahead in the count at any point in that bat including one oh 10 times throughout the afternoon they got like they got ahead in the count so you're not setting up yourself up for success the other issue is not only are they constantly behind in the count they don't make pitchers work you talk about how the cubs are knocking starters out of the game these guys get down early and it's a lot of very quick at bats like at one point they were averaging just over in a couple of these shutouts like opening day was an example of it too it was just under four pitches in that bat. I think Saturday's game was like 3.6 pitches in that bat was what they were averaging. So like, if you're not, if you're getting behind the count and you're not making pitchers work, you're facing an uphill battle when you don't have a lot of talent. Now, the interesting thing is you would think by getting behind the count that they're expanding their strike zone, which they're not because they're third in the majors as far as swinging at pitches inside the strike zone and out of the strike zone. So they're swinging at good pitches. They're just not doing anything with them. So, like, that's where it's kind of like a double-edged sword where it's like, man, and I get the approach that they're trying to have because Robert talked about it this offseason. 
where he was like, my focus is being focusing on pitches in my quadrant of the strike zone where I was really good. And those are the ones I'm starting to swing at to be a little bit more disciplined. And I've seen this with a couple of different hitters where they're very selective about what they're going after. But the problem is if you're going to get behind in the count, you've got to start following off pitches, which they don't do. And a lot of times the pitches in the strike zone, they just don't do any damage with them. Like Cal, Cal Ripken Jr. was talking on MLB Network about what he saw with the White Sox, especially with runners in scoring position. And that's the other issue, too. When they do get guys on base, which is rare because they're constantly behind the count and not doing anything with strikes, they don't hit them in. So he's like, yeah, that was the other problem I've noticed. It looks like these guys are all trying to hit home runs because they don't have a very good approach with runners in scoring position. So there's a lot that goes into this. Um, I think Robbie Grossman moving him to the top of the order has helped. I think he's had some good at-bats early. He's willing to take a walk. Ben Intendi is frustrating as he's been. I see signs that like he's starting to make pitchers work. Like he had a strikeout yesterday with runners in scoring position, which usually you'd be frustrated, but he was down one, two in the count. He worked the full count. So it sucks that he struck out, but at least he's making the start to work. That was a professional looking at bat, despite the fact he struck out. So I am fine if guys start doing that, but they got to make these starters work more because they don't have margin for error. They don't have a lot of talent. So, you know, if you're going to take that patient approach and like look for pitching your quadrant, you got to do damage with them. And that's what they did yesterday. And that's why they were able to put up so many runs, but that's like, what's really stood out with the, uh, with this offense. Cause it's, it's brutal. You talked about the injuries and that's put guys, you know, Andrew Vaughn now has to be the run producer in the middle of the lineup. Uh, Dominic Fletcher is starting in center field. You know, Ben Intendi has to be, he's moved down to the five spot. Uh, you know, he has to show something in year two. Who Who's the one guy that you're, that you want to see the most out of? Like who's, or going forward, the guys who are on the team right now, because I know a lot of them aren't going to matter in the future, but right. for you, who are you looking for? To like, please show something. Please. Fletcher, I think, is the big one. Because there's a lot of hoopla made about that trade when it happened. Did we finally find our future right fielder? Um, so he is a guy that I've been watching very closely. Corey Lee's another one. Just because we know that he could potentially be the future catcher next year. I would like an ideal world for him. And he's been sitting decent to start this season. He can keep that up. Uh, I think there's an argument that could be made. If he, he keeps up what he's doing, you could keep Stassi in triple A. You know, Pedro Grifo was talking about competition during all spring training. Well, I would hope that rolls over into the regular season because he has earned a chance to at least stay in the MLB. Um, and if you want Maldonado to help with work with that pitching staff, then like, I, I think an argument can be made that those are the two guys to keep up. Then you have Caro and Lee as your catchers moving forward long-term. That's not bad. So, uh, Fletcher and Lee are the two guys I'm really watching. And Vaughn, this is a big make or break year for him. You know, Pedro's got him in the middle of the order. He's not really going to move him there. I was surprised he moved Ben Intendi out of the one because we saw how stubborn he was last year with Tim Anderson not wanting to move him. So that was encouraging. But if you're going to have Vaughn in the middle of the order, like, because at some point you might have to move out of that. Like, you got to start producing RBIs, which he did yesterday. So those would be the big three that I'm watching because I think at some point, if, if Vaughn has another bad year, you've got to start looking at like your Tim Elko's or like moving out from the first base side defensively too. It's not, he hasn't been great defensively there either. He's been okay, but there's a lot of plays, especially like pop flies in the infield that you would see a Bray you make or in like foul territory. And a lot of these are tough catches over the shoulder. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like it's an easy play, but like we'd see Jose Abreu you make those not seeing Andrew Vaughn make those. So those are the big three. And, and that's the tough part with like, I know Andrew Vaughn's been one of those guys who's been highly debated over the years on Sox Twitter. And, like, that's the thing that when you break it down, it's – like, last year, like, he put up, like, okay numbers, right? Like, they were he wasn't, like, horrible, right? right. You know, he was an above-average hitter. But when you do play a position where there's not – to begin with, there's just not a lot of defensive value at first base. So, if you're – even, like, the great ones, like, you look at some of their war numbers. Like, it's not, like – Right. Amazing. Like Anthony Rizzo was a like gold glove first baseman for the Cubs, but he was putting up like four war seasons just because the defense, there's not a lot of defensive value there, even when you're good. Andrew Vaughn is not good, so that brings him down. <laughs> He's yeah. He doesn't have speed. He's not a good base runner. That brings down his value. So when you do play first base, you are expected to be a good power hitter. And again, he wasn't horrible. He had like, what, 23 home runs, something like, like that? Yeah. Yeah. Which again, good. But like when you compare it to the rest of the league, it's like it's kind of average. Like not like it's like nothing nothing special there for Vaughn. He doesn't walk a lot, and like that was a big. I remember when Abreu was still with the White Sox, people would get on like, "Oh, this guy swings at everything. He doesn't really take walks." 
But hey, he was hitting 30 plus home runs. He was driving. He hit runs. for average too. He, he hit for average. average. Yeah. I hit around 300 every year. Andrew Vaughn is just the definition of mid. Like everything yeah. he does, just average. And like two that's just not going to cut it when you're. Yeah, I know. You're, it's true. He is. He is the definition of average. I wonder how much of his development was hurt by the fact that he got rushed up with very little minor league time because there's a lot of expectations placed on him because out of college he was touted this is the most advanced hitter in this draft. But he gets rushed to the major leagues, is playing out of position for a year. Now he doesn't have that excuse anymore at first base, which is why this is this year especially because like they're not playing him out of position. Last year they didn't really play him out of position. So like that excuse is kind of gone. I just wonder, and that's why I'm hesitant to rush Montgomery up. I do think you call him up at some point, but I'm fine with letting Colson stay in AAA a few months and then calling him up. I would rather call him up near August, September, just because this lineup, he's not going to have a whole lot of protection in the lineup anyway. So like, let him, there's no harm in letting the guy, you know, build his confidence, AAA develop a little bit. Cause I, I, I do wonder how much of that affected Vaughn when he got rushed up, but you know, it's at this, we're, we're, we're what you're four with, with him. So no. At some point, there's only so many excuses you can make for a guy. You just got to start producing. Like that's the thing we did for for most teams, but especially for the Sox, when you look at guys in arbitrations, like you're kind of running out of time before free agency. There's not a lot of trade value there, so like they're obviously hoping that he pans out. It's like please break out, be show some power, but uh, I don't know about that one. Um, this I've, you know I've, I've been skeptical at Vaughn and just. He just hasn't gotten out of that malaise of like he'll have a couple good games. You know, last year his second half, I think, was okay. He started to hit for for a little bit more power, but it's like, can we see it for a full year? And rough start so far. But um, what did, what do you want to hit up next? Uh, the injuries well, or full? We'll go injuries, and then we can go injury or full. So Yoan Moncada went down. That is their big three now out Eloy at least is taking swings I saw him taking some batting practice this weekend didn't look like the swing was all the way there but taking BP is a good sign you could tell he was kind of taking it easy and in between he you know he was dancing around with guys too so like I think he will be back relatively soon but like Moncada and Robert like that's that's brutal because Robert outside of crochet this year and some of these other young guys he was really the only reason you want to watch this team so that's very frustrating to see him go down and with Robert now his future is a lot more in question too because you had a guy that like you thought you're going to be building around for the future but he's only got a couple years left now this is almost going to be a lost season so it's like this is two major injuries same type of injury twice now how much can you really rely on him going forward because he's starting to get the injury prone label now too and then Moncada goes down with that one I, I think he's that's sad I think his days like this is his final year as a White Sox. It probably was either way, but like that's devastating for a guy like that who needed to have a big year because I don't think his market was going to be all that big in free agency anyway. And now yeah. you have that. Now that sucks for him because there is still some talent there. It's just, you know, it's it's a lineup that doesn't have a lot of talent and then you lost your three best guys already. So. I remember bringing it up before uh, before Tuesday's game, how, and I think Rafael talked about it uh, in their pregame with the media, how you know, Mankato was playing through pain. I put in the chat. I was being a little sarcastic, but it was like, hey, because, you know, mankata has been clown for years. Like, oh, this guy's soft, made of glass. He doesn't – any little thing, he's not going to play. I think last year he played through some stuff, but obviously missed a lot of time. This year, you know, Gravol said he was dealing with a hip groin, and then he gets hurt, like, you know, three hours later. Yeah. It's like, fuck. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, though. Because I wonder, and this is a big argument with the Eloy injury. And I was very frustrated when it happened, too. Because with Eloy, it's like it's all happening, just running to first base. It's like very stupid stuff. And so he gets that label, and fans are frustrated. People calling him the biggest disappointment in Chicago sports history. And, you know, knee jerk, I was right there with him. It's like, yeah, like, what's this guy doing where he can't stay healthy? But it's not like he wants to get hurt. He wants to be on the field. He's not trying. His body is just failing him. So... You know, in my opinion on that kind of change, like seeing Moncada try and play, because I wonder too how much went into it because he had that label where he's getting clowned on for being injury pro, where he wanted to gut through something that he probably should have been paying, playing through. And that helped, like, that was part of this injury because it was the same thing. Like, you know, you see Eloy, all the flack that he got. Moncada's got the history of being injury prone. Fans call him like Glass Boy and whatnot. And 
So, you know, all right, I'm going to show them. I'm going to try and play through this. And then it ended up making it worse. So I wonder how much of that factored into it. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate. I think after the after the Eloy injury and then a little bit with uh, Luis Robert Jr. after him, a lot a lot of the discussion was like, well, who is to blame, right? Like I, and like you said, players aren't out there; they're not looking to get hurt. They don't want to get hurt, obviously not, right? But when you see the pattern, like year after year, is is it the White Sox training staff? I know, I, see that a lot. I, I know, I've, I've seen some pushback. Like, no, they hired a new head guy. But like they still have guys in place, but it's the same players, it's the same type of injuries. I know last year when the all the all the leaks started coming out from the clubhouse, you know, I think I think both guys, Eloy and Yuan, were like labeled as guys who don't really work out pregame or like don't do the work. So that's kind of a tough look. But like it, it, I, it's a very uncomfortable, at least for outside looking in that conversation of like, well, it's those guys' fault for getting hurt. Well, but, like it, you want to push against it, but then at the same time, I can kind of see it's like, well, are they putting in the right work? I I don't know. And I think it's a fair criticism for Eloy just because we keep seeing the same type of injury. And I hate blaming guys for because like a lot of them are freakish and, you know, it is a fluke, but they just hired a new training staff. Like you said, that training staff is also responsible for 25 other guys. They cannot be babysitting Eloy Jimenez and these guys that are injury prone like the whole way through. You know, Jesse Rogers came out that report saying, hey, Eloy, not really the hardest worker. You watch him pregame, doesn't look like he necessarily goes through the same stretching routine. Frank Thomas brought up the point, too, that as a DH, without playing in the field, Eloy, it doesn't look like he knows how to stay loose. And when you're the size of Eloy, like, you have to find ways to keep yourself loose. Otherwise, you get in the box, you do these explosive movements. It's easier for you to... So, you know, you got to take care of your body. I think you see, like, look at LeBron James, for example. He spends a million dollars a year on his body, and now that's unrealistic. But, like, he takes care of himself. That's why he's hardly ever hurt, and he's still playing at a high level at 38. Like, a lot of it kind of goes in with, like, these guys. It's like, you know, you got to be taking care of your body during the offseason. Now, the counterpoint is, like, Luis Robert, he's ripped. He's in really good shape. He's getting hurt, too. So, who knows? I don't think you can blame the training staff, though. And I do think a lot of it, especially with the Eloy, because it's the same type of injury we keep seeing. It's a pattern. Like, at some point, you got to be doing something to address it during the offseason. And I hate ripping guys for injuries. It sounds unfair, but, like, I think a little bit of blame kind of has to go has to go on these. It has to go on the plate. And, like, I, re- I remember when we were talking about the clip, and, you know, I, I think you wrote about it in the offseason when Eloy was on foul territory. And, like, even his goal of like, I want to play 150 games, but like, even then it was a doubt. It was like, uh, you know, if he said, like, I you know, he was talking about the home runs, right? Runs, dot, dot, dot. If I can stay healthy. If I can, yeah. Even. It's like, like, like he already knows it too. Like it's already in the back of his mind. Like, oh, I mean, I, maybe if I stay healthy, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Was, the Eloy one is tough. Cause like that, that's the thing. Like Luis Robert Jr. Last year, I, what, what, did he not, you know, was the trainer's, did the trainers do a good job last year? Not this year. Yeah. Uh, but like with Eloy, you hear the reports. There is the talk of, you know, that, that he, that he doesn't know how to stretch. He doesn't stretch. Uh, the, sure. the sad thing is both those injuries happen with them hustling out of the box. <laughs> out of all the shit that Pedro <laughs> promised this year, we're going to be aggressive on the base pass. We're playing fast. You know, we, you know, we're going to hustle. You know, we haven't seen any small ball from this team. They've been terrible on the base pass. Nicky Lopez has gotten thrown out four times so far this season. So they're not stealing any bases, which I knew was going to happen. They, haven't, they don't have a team built for that. But I will say they have done what Pedro said during spring training. They are running hard out of the box. I see a lot of aggressive turns, like out of first base, off of singles. And both those injuries happen with Robert digging hard out of the box, making an aggressive turn. Mancada racing to first base, trying to get an infield hit. So that's what's also like sad about these injuries is like, well, they're doing what you'd want a guy to do. <laughs> and that's how both these injuries happen is them running hard. So uh, before we get to Grafal, uh, because that's gonna be <laughs> maybe <laughs> Tony be. was on something. Remember when Tony was like, we have like five of our guys in the lineup that are allowed to dog it to first base to prevent injuries. Maybe, maybe he was on something. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say that, that gets <laughs> That becomes a conversation when teams are bad. It's like, oh, these guys aren't running. You look at great players or like guys who like stay on the field. They're not always. They're not always like running full speed at first base. Right. Like that's. I think that's a little overrated. Like because that you do get more injuries when yeah. you like try hard every single ground ball. Like, and and you get that kind of talk when it's a bad team. It's like, all right, guys, we got to do all the little stuff. 
we got to go, we got to do a little stuff hard. We got to put the pressure on because our team kind of sucks. We can't score runs. Please hustle to first base. Let's show them that we care. Um, Oscar Colas, I think he's called up now with uh, after the Mancata yep. injury. Yep. You have to play him, right? Like you can't, you, you got to stop with Kevin Pillar. I would think he's getting, yeah, he would have to, he's going to get some playing time. Like I This is really his last shot, though. Yeah. This is a big opportunity here for him. Because the Sox, had, it looked like they had essentially moved on from Colas. So it'll be very interesting to see how much playing time they do give him. Because Ben and Tenney's not going anywhere in left. I feel like they keep Fletcher. Him, right. So Pilar's, yeah, Pilar's probably the odd man out. He's going to get a couple of looks. Let's see what, see what he can so- do with it. So I completely get because I think it, it might have been a similar situation to Vaughn, where or not exactly apples to apples, but like maybe Colas needed more time at AAA last year before he was called up, and obviously he struggled in the majors and then got sent right back down, and then called up uh, later on. But like I remember back in 2021 with the Cubs, obviously it's a rebuild year, or 2022 it's a rebuild year. I don't I don't get why these teams sign these like fringe veteran guys give them like a lot of the playing time when you had like if Oscar Colas sucks again, that's fine. You know, then it's like, okay, Oscar Colas, not good. Okay. We get it. We can officially move on. There's no doubt. He, he knew, or he got his chance. He can't, he can't be resentful. Be like, they didn't ever give me a shot. Play your, play your, your young guys when it's a lost season. Who cares if Kevin Pillar is a good leader on the field leading to what 62 wins? Like who cares? What? Well, they're trying to fix the most the most overused word. Oh I'm God. guilty of it too. The culture in the locker room. So that's why their argument is they're bringing in all these guys. Which I, you know what? And Ozzy said it, and I, I think I've made too much of it too over the past years. Like, who gives a shit about the culture? Just win some games. You know what fixes the culture? Winning games. I, I'm with you. Play play some of these young guys. Um, and I, I think. Because the depth was so bad under Rick Hahn, I think Getz saw that, and so that's why he brought in a lot of these veterans too, just to like try and give these guys some more depth. But quantity doesn't necessarily equal quality. You can bring in all these aging <laughs> outfielders you want; it doesn't mean your depth's going to be improved if they all stink. So it's you know, we'll like, we see what he can do. And like that's fine. Kevin Pillar, okay, he's on the team. Right, have him be like the backup. Don't have him like splitting yeah. like fifty. He's a or... perfect fourth outfielder yeah. to have on that team. I am fine with him as a fourth outfielder. Like I get like Robert, I I like Robert Grossman. I think uh, you know a little bit of power, great eye at the plate, draws a lot of walks. Um, like that's like, cool, fine. But like, is that going to matter this season? But like I get it. Like a you, little you bit get some rest. Like, they don't have any guys. They need more guys on base. They need to start working some more professional at bats. And it also helps when you have a guy at the top of the order that's seeing a lot of pitches. So even if he is getting out, it's going to set up some of these younger guys you want to see do well for success. So you do need a couple of those guys in the lineup. You just can't have like all nine, like, you know, young guy. I think you do need a couple of professionals. In there. But like, just imagine if, and like, obviously you would prefer it. You get Luis Robert in line. Imagine Luis Robert Jr. Doesn't get hurt, right? He's obviously going to be starting every day in center field. So then you got Dom- Dominic Fletcher is only going to be playing half the time and right because you have you have Grossman you have Pilar or maybe one of those two guys gets out of the team because just because you know you're running out of spots there but it's like I think the plan was for Grossman to replace Pilar if the team was fully healthy as kind of like that fourth outfielder type deal a pinch hit bat use him occasionally Mm -hmm. in in right for matchups and whatnot but the injuries kind of derailed that plan um let's get to Pedro Grifol I mean I know I <laughs> we talked about it a little bit in the Sox chat on Tuesday. And like again, not to stick up for uh, Pedro Grafal. I just don't know how much of this he can fix. Cause like we said, the defense has been terrible. The offense without, you know, Mankata, Robert, uh, and Jimenez, like it's a it's a triple A lineup. Like what but what what do you got on Grafal here? There's so many, there's a lot of issues. That's a very valid, that is a very valid point. Um, and I think that the report came out that Jerry Reinsdorf had said he knew that it was a fireable season last year, but didn't Just want to. Just a, a quick thing on that. Anytime, and like he denied it later. I think Bruce, Bruce Levine tweeted out like a couple hours I'll later after it came out. Said. And, uh, you know, Reinsdorf denied it. But it's like, even if he like at this point he could there could be anything any report about the White Sox or Ryan Stroff and it's 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 all believable like it could be the most ridiculous thing 
And it's like, well, yeah, it, it's Ryan's fault. It's like, so like, it's just, that's how, that's how shitty of a situation he's put himself in the Sox. And of course he's going to deny it. But like, how can you say, I am going to try and turn this thing around as quickly as possible, which is why I hired Chris Getz, which is frustrating enough because Chris Getz is taking this year to evaluate the team, which is exactly what he said, why he brought Getz in. We don't need someone else from the outside coming in, having to reevaluate everything. Well, that's exactly what Getz is doing this year anyway. But how can you, if you say you truly want to like, flip this thing around as quickly as possible, watch what Pedro did last year and be like, yes, we need to keep him at the helm to turn this thing around quickly. Why not get a more established guy? I would even argue you could have a Montoya as the bench coach. I think he would do a much better job. Throw the interim tag. Um, there's two things that are very frustrating with, well, there's a lot of things that are frustrating with Pedro. Last year, I think it was just a bad fit because he was coming in as a first-year manager to a veteran clubhouse that's been expecting to win. So there's a lot of expectations, a lot of established veterans in there. Pedro clearly did not get in that locker room and like establish himself at the top. Very little people. This became apparent, respected Pedro. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm guilty of it. Like Beef Loaf wrote about this like earlier. Like, and I was one of the people like when he first got on, I was like, okay, you know what? Getz finally got his guy. He sounds good in this press conference. This is what the Sox need, which is all fine and well, but it became very apparent in April that that was all bullshit. They looked totally unprepared. They did not play hard. The veterans did, clearly didn't respect them. So by May, I knew I was out. I sold all my Pedro stock then. So that was number one. That was what was so frustrating last year because that team quit on. They quit on. They didn't look prepared. This year, it's frustrating because they don't have a lot of talent. You know, he's giving all that bullshit. We're going to play hard. You know, he had to, it's his press, like media and like press conferences. Like he needs some media training. Like this guy sounds like an idiot every time he gets to the microphone. And I get all this stuff, like wanting to like, you know, say I'm all about baseball. I am hell bent. I'm like, baseball is my only focus, but that, um, the, the eclipse comment. I mean, come on. You sound like an idiot. He, he can't like, <laughs> Well, what good does that do for you? To, and then he lied about it too. He, yeah, he, he saw it. Yeah, he's, like, right, he's lying about it. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I actually he's, did watch it. He's oh. trying to be such a hardo baseball guy, right? He's like, no, I I love baseball. I'm all like, all his quotes are just like, I'm obsessed with getting this team better. We're gonna try hard. Uh, baseball is my life. It's all I think about. It's just like, he's just he seems like a like. I don't mean to offend uh, Kevin here. Kevin, great high school coach. He seems like we're just one of those <laughs> like obnoxious high school over the top coaches. Like, dude, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> and like that's the other thing. We at least Pedro is giving us giving Sox fans. It might be annoying, but they're entertaining. I mean, you can clown them every day because you every every pregame, postgame, you're gonna get a Pedro quote. It's gonna be stupid. Uh, we can all laugh at no. it. Dude. It's just like they like uh, the. Roommate. By the way, shout out to uh, Nathan Chiba, ten dollars super chat. Thank, Thank you. Uh, thanks for the Pedro Grifol talk, guys. I'm ready to start drinking. Nathan, save save one for uh for tonight. Um, uh, how like how, what more does Pedro have to do to? Does he surpass? Has he already surpassed a uh, Jim Boylan bad? Remember for the Bulls, like that it's guy was very close. They're very comparable. Honestly, two guys that were not qualified for the job say very stupid stuff in the media, and guys clearly do not want to play for. It. Like, didn't Jim Boylan have like the the literal like the time clock, like the the clock in like at the <laughs> <laughs> Well, like all the like you listen to this guy talk. If I was a player, if I was like, what, what I wonder what he's saying in the locker room. If this is what he's saying out in public to us for like stuff that they usually like give you notes on and train you. Here's what you're gonna say. This is probably what they're gonna be asking you. And he still sounds this unprepared in these press conferences. What the hell could he possibly be saying to motivate this team? <laughs> like I listen to this guy, I'd be like, I'd be cringing if I had to listen to that every day. You know, I was in the locker room. Like I'm thinking about uh, Maldonado. Obviously, you know, right now he's probably at the he's at the end of his career. But you know, he's been a he's been in the league for a while. He's been on World Series teams. You know, he knows what it's to, to be on a on a, in a good franchise. Uh, you know, we can argue that what what we think about the, the Houston Astros, but you know he's been on good teams. <laughs> like yeah, like what is he thinking? Like in the locker room, Pedro, he probably is reading these motivational quotes that he's getting off like Google. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm thinking like the other veteran guys, like uh, you know Ben Intendi, again. He won. Uh, he was with the 
the Red Sox in 2018. You know, he's been on good teams. He's been went with the Yankees for a year. Yeah, what are these? What are these guys thinking? I, I mean, that's. It, there was a but, lot of promising signs when he was hired, just listening to what guys like Jorge Soler and Salvador Perez were saying too, where I actually, I truly was optimistic. And I've been burned on this before, drinking the Kool-Aid with managers more times than not. I'll admit it. I'm a homer at times. But like, yeah, it, that's what was so odd about it. Because especially like the year one, it was the complete opposite of everything we were promised. Like this guy was supposed to come in, make these guys play like hard nosed baseball where they're hustling every day and, you know, coming from looking more prepared each night, which was the complete opposite of what happened. They looked like one of the least prepared teams on the field every day. And this year, the defense is supposed to be so much better. The fundamentals and the defense, quite frankly, has looked just as bad as it did last year. But they're wasting a lot of good starting pitching, too. That's the other frustrating thing. And that's one of the reasons I thought they would exceed expectations. I knew they were going to be bad. But I'm like, I think they'll win a few more games than people think because there is some talent in this rotation. And it's shown early on. Crochet has been much better than we all thought. Um, he hasn't had a bad start yet. And they just waste it because there's no offense. The defense stinks. And the bullpen stinks. Other than that, everything's great. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the rotation's been pretty good. Cro Crochet has been unbelievable. And, you know, we talked about it all offseason. I kept bringing it up how, like, you know, Sox, they're still going to be bad. They're, gonna be, they're not going to be as bad. They're going to lose a lot of, you know, I thought there were going to be a lot of, you know, 62, 63 games. But the White Sox can't get to two runs. It's a lot. We're seeing a lot of six yeah. zeros, uh, four zeros. Um, you know, the offense. I know the injuries. But even then, man, it's, it's the lack of just anything. They don't. They still don't walk. Like the, the White Sox just refuse. I know they're starting too little. They're like, yeah. Like ben and Tendi, you know, start moving to the fifth spot, maybe showing a little Grossman. I think well, Grossman's been, been having their best at bats since he's been called. Up. But like overall, as a team, it's the same thing, same thing over and over again. Like, and again, I mean, the expectations, like we know, they're 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 just not going to be good, but. Like you said, there are some things that, unfortunately, due to injury, we're going to see a lot more of Dominic Fletcher, and hopefully he does show something, raises his floor from bench guy to maybe he is a starter uh, uh, moving forward. At the very least, maybe a, a solid uh, fourth outfielder. Uh, the defense does have to get better, though. That that uh, ball that he knocked over the fence, was that was, that was brutal. The in sequence City. in Kansas City, this uh, Sunday's game, there was a sequence. So they have, um, it was Freddie Fer Fermin for the Royals. Their catcher, backup catcher, not a fast guy. Hits a single up the middle. Fletcher overruns the ball. I completely misplaced it. So Fermin decides he's going to go to second base. So Fletcher has the air already. Grossman picks up the ball. And this was a very gettable out. Like they, he, he was dead to right. Throw away, well off the mark. He gets into second base. One batter later, they hit some little dribbler to the pitcher. And Leon airmails the first baseman. It's just like, what the hell is going on? And that that ended up being one of the difference makers in that game. It was it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And then Crochet, that same game, Crochet had a perfect game going. Perfect game got broken up because of a throwing air from Maldonado. No. Who's supposed to be a good defensive catcher? It's like, come on now. Quick quick question on Crochet. Uh it'll be the last thing before uh, we plug uh your weekly uh show right now. But uh, do you think at, at any point, I mean, they have to, like, they're, they're going to, like, ease off the gas? It's like, I all right. This, I think we saw it this weekend. Because he was yeah. only at 77 pitches through five innings. He definitely had another inning with them. You know, they were still holding a two-run lead at the time with a bullpen, which, like, that's a big ask, asking your bullpen to cover four, four innings with the way these guys have performed. Yeah. I was shocked, especially what they did the first two starts that they didn't let him go back out another inning. Because Crochet is going to give you a better chance to win than a lot mm. of these guys you have in your bullpen. So um, I, I think that was one of those instances where they did kind of like ease off a bit. And I think that's probably what we'll see a little bit more of. I think you're going to see a lot of those types of starts where he's throwing the ball well, but just out of caution, they're maybe not going to push him more than they should. Maybe some paranoia with all the pitching injuries. It could be. I'm not as worried about that with Crochet because he already went underwent the surgery, and I think we've seen that a lot of times. It's almost like a rite of passage. You get that Tommy John surgery, and if you recover, you do your rehab properly, you come back throwing just as hard as you once were. 
if not harder. And, you know, it, I think that has been the case with him so far too. Cause that's the other thing that's impressive. He'll be in the sixth, seventh inning, still pumping it in 97, 98 miles an hour. So mm -hmm. like it's still early in the year. We'll see how he holds up and looks in September. That's going to be like the real test is back half of the season. But like early on, I think all signs have been positive with him. I'm excited to see him against that uh, Cincinnati lineup this weekend too. Mm -hmm. And but by, by far, I think the big, I think Sox fans, you, you saw it in back in 2020, like, you know, the stuff is good. He had the injuries. But, like, I don't think anyone expected that, like, every time out he was going to look this great deep into the starts, pitching in the sixth, seventh inning. We, we surprise talked about it before, and, like, it's like everything. I think we talked about this last week, but it's like everything I wish ceased did early on. What makes him so good? He did not have his best stuff this weekend, but he just attacks the strike zone. He's confident saying, I'm going to throw my fastball in the zone, try and hit it. And, like, he had that quote post game Saturday where he's like, yeah, like, you know what? I'm going to make the, let the hitters beat me. If they beat me, they beat me. MJ Melendez, I think it was, hit a home run off him. He's like, yeah, you know what? So be it. He throws strikes. And that's why you see him so efficient in these because he gets ahead of hitters, he attacks hitters, and he knows his stuff is good. Because oftentimes or not, he throws that fastball, it's going to beat him. Yep. All right, Mitch. That's, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up for uh, this show. But you have an exciting announcement here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Each week, Wednesday, we're going to do the Pinwheels pregame show. So every Wednesday at noon, hop on, I will be hopping on, you know, about a half hour, 20 minutes, half hour each week, sharing some thoughts on the White Sox, a little bit on the Cubs, getting you geared up for the main show. So you can hop in during your lunch break. Who doesn't want more Pinwheels and Ivy talk um, and get you geared up for uh, for the main show? So starting from next, starting next week, every Wednesday, 12 o'clock, you want a little extra baseball talk, hop on here uh, with me. Looking forward to this project. Because it stinks now. It's, it's it's fortunate, like, with the with the work in the evening shows, you know, I don't get the chance to hop on. Usually when I'm on, when I'm on we're in nonsense hours. Uh, but <laughs> so, if you're interested in hearing my baseball takes, every Wednesday at noon. That's true. That's true. No, no show tonight. Uh, again, we got Zoe flying Kevin's uh, with high schoolers. Um, not in a bad way. He's uh, chaperoning them. Uh, but yeah, uh, Kevin, by in. Way, make sure to tune in yeah. every Wednesday afternoon with Mitch. Uh, Pinwheels pregame uh, starting next week. Again, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming next Wednesday night. Jump in the chat. Thanks for the people joining us uh, today. Uh, any any final words, Mitch? Well, I was gonna say Kevin's like what the White Sox need. He sounds like he's running a tight ship with those high schools. He's got duct tape on the doors. He's got a tight 10 p.m. <laughs> curfew. Of that, that's that's what they need. Some strict discipline at the White yeah. Sox clubhouse. <laughs> well, Mitch, good show. Thanks for coming on. Uh, make sure to tune into Sports Mockery. Download the app. Read all our stories. Uh, until next week. Thanks for coming on. Mitch Aldo signing out.